Good to have you with us. This is Arirang News coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gyeong. Well, it seems like Korea has a new prime minister now. Lee Won Gu was confirmed after a dramatic day at the National Assembly. Today, we have our Ji Myung Gil on the line to tell us more. So, Myung Gil, what can you tell us now? Well, Hyun Gyeong, after four days of bipartisan wrangling over the prime minister nominee Lee Won Gu, was finally confirmed on Monday. 148 lawmakers voted against the 140 lawmakers voted to confirm E. 120 voted against the confirmation. Before E's confirmation, he was facing numerous allegations over various ethical lapses, including real estate speculation, draft dodge, and allegation that he tried to stop the press from carrying negative reports about him. He has been third prime minister nominee since May. The first two nominees withdrew over allegations of ethical and other lapses. So, myung with the prime minister confirmed now, uh, we can expect a cabinet reshuffle coming up soon, no? Yeah, that's right. The presidential office is expected to carry out a small reshuffle involving cabinet members and presidential aides based on the new prime minister's recommendations. With E's confirmation, the presidential office was able to avoid criticism over a poor voting system and avoid a vacuum in state affairs. In Korea, the prime minister is the second highest position after the president, but the job has been largely ceremonial as the power is heavily concentrated president. Outgoing Prime Minister Chung Won delivered a farewell speech just about an hour ago, thereby relinquishing his position. I'm Chim Young Gil reporting live from the National Assembly. All right, that was our Chim Young Gil reporting for us. Thank you very much. Now, in other news we are following, President Park Geun-hye has called for a unification roadmap that includes benefits for not only the two Koreas, but their neighboring countries and the world. At a meeting with her Unification Preparatory Committee, President Park highlighted a need for overseas public and private investment in infrastructure for a unified Korea to offset the anticipated unification costs. Her envisioned blueprint would include funding for social overhead capital and resources development in the North. Now, she also asked the committee to work with civic groups to expand people to people exchanges so that the economic and social gaps between the two Koreas can be narrowed. In the meantime, North Korea is celebrating the 73rd birthday of its late former leader Kim Jong il on this Monday. North Koreans call this day the Day of the Shining Star. The state run Korean Central News Agency says Kim Jong un visited the mausoleum called Kumsusan Palace of the Sun at midnight to pay tribute to his father and grandfather Kim Il sung. The young leader was accompanied by key high ranking officials, but his wife Lee Sol Ju and sister Kim Yo Jung were not present. The state media also ran a live broadcast of Pyongyang residents setting off fireworks over the Taedonggang River to mark the anniversary. North Korea watchers say lavish firework displays have become more common in Pyongyang since Kim Jong-un came into power. In many parts of the world, we continue to see countries ease their monetary policies. But what about Korea? The central bank will hold its monetary policy meeting tomorrow. Attention is on whether it will follow the path of its global counterparts. Arirang News' Hwang Ji-hae has more. So far this year, 17 countries and the European Central Bank have eased their monetary policies either by lowering their key interest rates or introducing quantitative easing programs. 
Canada, Switzerland, and 11 emerging economies like India and China are in this race, which comes as the countries try to prop up their ailing domestic economies. Now, pressure for further monetary easing by Korea's central bank is piling up. But analysts say it's unlikely the central bank will take action on Tuesday. This month's monetary policy meeting is taking place right before the Lunar New Year holiday, and the central bank has not signaled a rate cut. So we'll keep the rate unchanged for this month. Korea's finance minister Che kyung hwan also emphasized last week that it's more important to push through structural reforms than to debate over a rate cut. Still, analysts expect a rate cut to take place sometime in the second quarter this year. The Korean economy is not showing signs of momentum for a solid recovery so far this year, just like in the fourth quarter of last year. To give a much-needed boost to the economy, the central bank is expected to cut the rate in April or May before the U.S. Federal Reserve starts to raise its key interest rate. Korea's low inflation rate is also giving the central bank room to trim its key interest rate. Consumer prices were running below the BOK's 2.5 to 3.5 percent inflation target ban for more than two years in January. Some analysts say, however, that the central bank will not join the global move toward monetary easing as there's no clear sign of it affecting the local financial market. Huang Jie, Adang News. Investments coming from China and Japan are increasing. The combined net buying of Korean shares and bonds by the two neighboring countries hit a high not seen since 2010. Arirang News' Kim Minji has this story. Foreign capital, especially from China and Japan, is pouring into the Korean financial market. According to the Financial Supervisory Service, Chinese and Japanese investors bought a net 6.7 billion U.S. dollars worth of Korean shares and bonds last year. That's more than double from 2013 and an all-time high since the watchdog first began compiling such data in 2009. Experts say while other countries have been cautious when it comes to Korea, which has been suffering from slow growth and low prices, China and Japan have been aggressive in tapping into the market. Last year, Japanese investors bought a net $2.8 billion worth of shares on the Seoul Bourse, while Chinese investors bought a net $1.8 billion in shares. Combined, it's a significant number considering that the total net purchases made by foreigners came to $5.7 billion. On the bond market, Chinese investors bought a net $2 billion in bonds last year, becoming the largest investor. In terms of bond holdings, China ranks second, trailing behind the United States. Experts say the inflow of capital from the two neighboring nations can be attributed to China's rapid economic growth and Japan's quantitative easing programs. Kim min Arirang News. The cashable assets of Korean conglomerates hit a record high last year amid lingering financial uncertainties. Data from the Bank of Korea and local investment firms shows that the combined cashable assets of the country's top 500 firms reached over 144 billion U.S. dollars as of the end of the third quarter of 2014. Now that amount represents an increase of roughly seven billion dollars from the end of 2013 and a surge of nearly a hundred billion dollars compared to 10 years ago. Analysts attribute the spike to companies remaining reluctant to invest or having a hard time finding profitable investment opportunities due to economic uncertainties both at home and abroad. They point out that the firms should hand over more dividends to shareholders. The winds of change seem to be blowing through the global auto industry, with many of the world's leading automakers pulling factory operations out of emerging markets and putting them back into their home nations. Song ji reports. The days of automakers busily building new plants in emerging markets may soon be over, with demand slowing in those nations and the growing need to create more homegrown jobs in their own nations. The Korea Automotive Research Institute says auto demand in the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India and China, is expected to sag this year, especially when compared to recovery seen in developed markets like the U.S. and Europe. The Russian market is slumping at the fastest rate. 
It's projected to shrink 29 percent this year, marking negative growth for the third consecutive year. China, the world's largest auto market, still boasts annual demand of 20 million units, up 8 percent from last year, but that's slower than last year's 11 percent expansion. With emerging markets slowing, some leading automakers are going back to their roots. Ford, for example, relocated its Mexican truck factory to Ohio last year, following the U.S. government's decision to give auto firms incentives for creating new jobs in the United States. Japanese automaker Nissan also announced it was bringing operations at its rogue factory in the U.S. state of Tennessee back to Japan. That said, Korean automakers Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors are still expanding their production output overseas. Domestic demand in Korea is limited and they're looking to catch up with global automakers in terms of annual production units. Song ji Sun, Arirang News. People tend to think negatively about the aging of the Korean population and there's certainly reason for worry given the financial challenges it's likely to pose in the future. But for some, it's an opportunity for business. Arirang News' Connie Kim takes a closer look, at, look on this week's Industry Insight. Come 2026, about a quarter of the nation's total population will be 65 or older. Now zeroing in on this lucrative market, Korea's medical machinery industry is targeting the silver generation. The domestic medical device industry has been growing about 5% annually over the past six years, topping 4.2 billion U.S. dollars in 2013. And it'll only increase as demand rises with the changing senior demographic. But it's not a surge in cutting-edge operating room hardware that's leading the way. Looking at the most recent data, the top manufactured devices were dental implants devices and dental alloys used in fillings. About 9 out of 10 seniors in Korea are implant recipients. The country's leading dental x-ray manufacturer, Vatec, is just one of the many companies that see the potential for this market and is aiming to cash in. It's important to use accurate dental x-rays, especially for seniors, considering that implant surgery comes with high risk. We expect a surge in demand for our x-ray machines. And another fact, one in five seniors are known to be suffering from diabetes. Green Cross MS, a company that specializes in diagnostic tools, recently acquired a blood glucose monitor maker. The company says it's a landmark deal that'll help it focus more on developing technology for the elderly. This will help us access the ubiquitous healthcare market. We are currently doing research on how a smartphone could be used to track heart rates, cholesterol, and hemoglobin levels. Medical devices are evolving, going smart and high-tech. Analysts forecast the industry will continue to head towards helping older generations. Medical machines have gotten smaller, small enough for elders to carry around. If the technology to send data from these medical machines to hospitals are developed, a new ubiquitous healthcare industry will open up. Korea's changing demographics are affecting how the local market will expand. In the past, medical advancements and devices squarely focused on curing people and saving lives. But now, the landscape of the industry is shifting towards helping people live healthier and longer. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. Egypt is fighting back. Its military says it has bombed the so-called Islamic State militants in Libya in response to an IS video which shows the brutal mass beheading of 21 Egyptian Christians. Arirang News' Connie Lee has this story.
Egypt's president says his country will avenge the killings of its people by the terrorist group calling itself Islamic State. Egypt reserves the right of retaliation and with the methods and timing it sees fit for retribution from those murderers and criminals who are without the slightest humanity. His televised statement comes just hours after the militants released a horrifying video on Sunday, appearing to show the beheading of 21 Egyptian Coptic Christians. The killings take place not in the militant group's known territory of Syria or Iraq, but in Libya. Egypt's state-run news agency quoted a spokesperson for the Coptic Church, confirming that the 21 Egyptian captives are dead. The U.S. has also condemned the terrorists for the killing of innocents, saying it is just the most recent of the many vicious acts they've committed. In the five-minute video, the victims, all male and wearing orange jumpsuits, are shown being marched along a beach. Each victim is accompanied by a terrorist in a black mask holding a knife. The video is called A Message Signed with Blood to the Nation of the Cross. And as it takes place in Libya, it raises concern that the militant group is expanding and has an affiliate outside of the group's core territory of Iraq and Syria. The victims who were working in Libya were kidnapped by the terrorist group two months ago and have ignited demonstrations in Egypt with protesters urging the government to take action. Thousands of Egyptians are said to have gone to Libya in search of work since the Arab Revolution there in 2011. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And on to the latest on the shootout in Denmark that happened over the weekend. Police in Denmark say the suspected gunman was a 22-year-old Danish national. Officials are now trying to find out if there was a person or group supporting his actions. Chun Jung-in reports. Police in Denmark are focusing their investigation on the gunman's movements before, during and after the deadly twin shootings that ended on Sunday when he was shot dead by police. Danish intelligence agency chief says the suspect, a 22-year-old man born in Denmark, was on their watch list prior to the attack. It's a person who was known to us, so yes, it was a person on intelligence's radar. Withholding his name, authorities said the attacker was known to the police for several criminal offenses, including violence, gang-related activities, and possession of weapons. After assessing CCTV footage, police believe the man acted alone, but they're still trying to see if the suspect received assistance from others. The gunman opened fire at an arts cafe that was hosting a debate on freedom of speech on Saturday afternoon. Among those in attendance was Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilks, who has received death threats in 2007 when his depiction of the Prophet Muhammad as a dog was published. The suspect was shot dead early on Sunday after a second attack at a synagogue. The carnage killed two civilians and injured five police officers. The Danish prime minister says the shooting was a politically motivated terrorist attack and she promised to protect freedom of speech and the Jewish community in the country. The incident brings up memories of the recent terror attack in Paris. The French ambassador to Denmark, who attended Saturday's debate, believes the motivation for the cafe shooting was the same as for the shooting at the French weekly Charlie Hebdo that left 12 people dead. Son Jung in Arirang News. The ceasefire declare, declared in eastern Ukraine appears to be sticking. Mostly holding is how the mediators of Germany and France are characterizing it. Sounds of shelling still continue to be heard in the strategic transport hub of the Baltsova, though. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe says it dispatched 20 patrols across eastern Ukraine to monitor the situation on the ground. But it said its monitors were kept out of the Baltsova, which pro-Russia uh, rebels have fought to surround in recent weeks. The UN Security Council in the meantime is preparing a resolution that would codify the Minsk deal inked by Ukraine, Russia, Germany and France. And staying with the UNSC, the 15-member governing body has officially demanded that healthy rebels withdraw from Yemen's seat of government. A resolution drafted by the UK and Jordan received unanimous approval in an emergency meeting on Sunday. The UN body called for a, quote, immediate and unconditional 
withdrawal of Houthi forces and an end to foreign interference. Now this, as tens of thousands continued their protests in Yemen against the rebel movement over the weekend, at least four people were killed when gunmen opened fire. The Houthi mil militia, widely believed to be backed by Iran, has set up its own ruling body after seizing power in January. Eurozone finance ministers will meet in Brussels later on this Monday to discuss the future of Greece's bailout program. Ahead of that meeting, though, thousands poured into the streets across Greece in an anti-austerity protest. Police said the rally outside of the Parliament House in Athens alone drew some 20,000 people. Crowds held up banners reading, Stop Austerity, Support Greece, Change Europe, as they said, austerity policies were impoverishing the people. Protests also spread to cities beyond the country's borders. In Paris, a group of 2,000 people showed solidarity against what they called the Goliath of finance as they marched through the city center. Now on a lighter note now, while other musicals have come and gone, Jekyll and Hyde has remained popular for the past decade here in Korea. And over the weekend, it reached the milestone of its 1,000th show. Immuni has this story. A man determined to find out why there is both evil and good within humankind. But along the process, Dr. Henry Jekyll finds himself at the mercy of a great evil within his own body, who appears in the form of Hyde. The musical first debuted in Korea in 2004 and was an immediate hit. Through the years, it steadily attracted audience members, filling the theater at over 80 percent capacity with each show. Before, no matter how early I tried to book tickets, I could never get a good seat. This time around, I was able to get my hands on something. When Yu Jung Han plays Jekyll, he gives a powerful performance. And when Cho Sung Woo plays the role, the overall impression is so different, but each performance has its charms. Now, in its 11th year, the musical boasts over 106 million audience members. And this past weekend, it reached its 1,000th show, a landmark accomplishment for a musical. But there's no mystery as to why. With a star studded cast and special effects to match, it's a show built on the hard work of all those involved. It's exciting, and to be able to do 1,000 performances is such an honor. I always tell people that Jekyll and Hyde is the best performance I've been in. Jekyll and Hyde has been shown on all the major theaters throughout the country and has become a household musical name in the country, now joining the ranks of Korea's most prestigious musical productions. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Welcome back. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. It's currently drizzling nationwide and we can expect it to last until the end of the day. So make sure to have your umbrellas with you on your evening commute. Now the estimated amount of precipitation will vary depending on where you are here in Korea. Kaunda province can expect the most up to 30 millimeters and is hard between 5 and 20, while Jeju and Jeolla, the province can expect the least up to 5 millimeters. Now, although it's raining right now, temperatures are mild and we are expecting them to remain that way all throughout the long holiday weekend. However, we have another round of rain in store for us on Saturday, making up to Sunday, so make sure to plan your weekends accordingly. Now, let's have a look at the readings for today. So, we'll peak up to 7 this afternoon, while the southern regions such as Gwangju and Busan will reach up higher at 10 and 9 degrees. And to other regions, Jeju Island gets up to 14, Tokdo hits down to 5, while Mount Kungang is is snowing at negative one degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that brings us to the end of this newscast. I'm Na Hyun Kyung in Seoul. I'll be back with all of that and more at 6 p.m. Korea time.